Hi, this is Jared from the G2 Gallery Podcast. I'm just here to tell you that Clyde and Nikki Butcher are two dynamic individuals. Therefore, we have multiple podcasts with the two of them. Enjoy. Hi, welcome to the G2 Gallery Podcast. Today we have a really special guest with us, uh, Mr. Clyde Butcher, who is the photographer that we are showing in the Visions of America exhibit right now at the G2 Gallery. How are you? Oh, great. It's uh, great to be in Venice. Yes, <laughs> the other Venice. Yes. Because yeah, um, you're from Venice, Florida, that is, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. So let me uh, start off and uh, let's talk a, a little bit about what you're doing out here in California. Well, actually, this is kind of, it was really kind of neat uh, to come out for this exhibit because it gave me an excuse to photograph on the way. Yeah. Uh, we've been gone since the day after Christmas. Huh. Uh, we photographed... Uh, Canyon de Shea, Grand Canyon, Alabama Hills, um, the uh, Bristol Cone Pine, um, the Red Rock Canyon. Yeah. Uh, another play, Pinnacles place, just south of uh, uh, Long Pine. Yeah. So we've, and, had, we've been having a lot of fun. That's a, that's a, and, and, and is that what you sort of set out to do this during the trip was to photograph um, mostly and then just stop at the... I mean, when was the last time you traveled out to California? Uh, last time I was out here photographing was 2007. Okay. I did a workshop in Death Valley, and uh, then after I showed everybody uh, what was really interesting, and after they left, I did my pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the, the work that you have uh, these days. Now, you've been shooting for... A long time, all your life. I actually, mean, actually, there's um, two or three images in the show that were shot in 1971. Which two? Uh, the driftwood. Okay. And uh, uh, the sand dune, a couple of sand dune shots. Yeah. Yeah. And so, when you now, now that you're uh, you're still shooting, now how would how did you how have you progressed? How have you noticed? in retrospect, sort of the progression of your photography? Well, when I first started out, <clears throat> which was like 1961. Yeah, wow. I didn't know, it was a whole, com I didn't know what to do. Right. So I was emulating Ansel Adams and Weston and Wynn Bullock. So I was basically photographing more, I say, artistic compositions of things. Okay. And now I've progressed into more environmental type images that lead you into the photograph. And a lot of the photographs that are really good, there's nothing in the center. Oh, yeah. So it's a whole different concept. The, the edges of my photograph are the important parts. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's really different than uh, they're taught in photography. Is that, was that just like a, something you've noticed, or was that a, a conscious sort of decision? Or? It was actually, I probably, in my 1973, really started photographing the Redwoods up by Eureka. Mm -hmm. And that was a natural feeling that I felt there. Yeah. And that's followed me through and I think it's really gives me a distinct look of what I'm doing. It's quite different and on the, one of the problems with it though, to make it look right, they have to be large. Yeah. Yeah. And these are large prints that we have at the yeah. gallery if you, yeah. if you haven't seen them yet. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different way. Like I say, I make my pictures large so you can't see them. Right. Because you have to scan them. Yeah. And that gives you a feeling of being there. If, if you people don't understand how they see, you're just you're looking at me, and you're st just you're still scanning. Yeah. Uh, you can't see, but more than five degrees. It's true. You can perceive more. Yeah. But you can't see more. So, so people, you're really focused in on just very specific. So people details. like, and why I use a large format camera, is so when you see the grass or you see something, it's in detail. Mm-hmm. Your, your brain likes stuff to be sharp and in detail. And yeah. I, I'm a, I guess you might call it an Ansel Adams F64 type guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because of the detail that's in your, I mean, that's what right. everyone's coming in and saying is just that yeah. the, the detail is so right. incredible. And, and that's, and that to me, that's, uh, gives you a better feeling of being there. Again, that's what you do in your reality. Mm -hmm. um, that's true. You focus on very small 
Yeah, you're it's walking a, along, and you look down, you see some something neat deal on the, by your feet, mm -hmm. and then you look up at the tree, mm -hmm. you look around here, and you're constantly uh, seeing new things. And then when my photographs are so large and so much so complicated sometimes, you keep seeing new things all the time, uh, even after you have it on your wall for a year. This has been part one of Clive Butcher's podcast. Up next is part two. This is part four of Clive Butcher's podcast. You've become, and 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 you might review this, but you might you've become famous. Well, that's what everybody says. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. I look at it this way. I, I still put my pants on one leg at a time. Right. Yes. But then you uh, make beautiful photos after. <laughs> so you yeah. know, it's it, you know, I just never have really. I just I don't. I just do what I do because I enjoy doing it, and it's, and it's an important job to do. And I don't think people if people are really serious about what they do. Yeah. Don't consider them famous. Well, I mean, has it? But did it, was there ever a moment where it sort of like you're like, oh my gosh, people know me. They know me. Like they, you know, people I've never met know. Like, well, yeah, you know, I'm out in the middle of Escalante somewhere and say, hey, Clyde, what are you doing out here? You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm in a restaurant in Washington, and they say, I thought you were in Florida. It's supposed yeah. to be in Florida. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I because I sneak out and do other things every yeah. once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, you can really use that, though. I mean, you can really. Uh... I I try to do it uh, judiciously. Right. Uh, you don't want to overdo it. Um, I try not to get too much in politics, but with our governor now, I'm afraid I'm going to get into it because mm -hmm. <laughs> he's such a. Yeah. Yeah. Have you written to Obama at all? Have you Have you done anything with his administration? Uh, I've done a little bit with the Department of Interior. Okay. And, um, but. They have, I, I'm one of these people that, I let them seek out me. Okay. I If they feel it's important, if they don't, then it's probably not important for me to talk to them. So, you didn't start off thinking that you'd be here. Oh, no, I mean, where I'm at today? Where, where you are today. No, I was, uh, well, actually I went to college as a math major. Yeah. And ended up being an architect. And in '69, decided I want to be an artist. How was that? What was that like? That I mean, that's a drastic change from well, that. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eventually, we ended up losing everything, living in a tent trailer with my wife and two kids. Wow. Oh gosh. <laughs> and uh, did you? Did you? I mean, was there a moment of when you were in that? No, I didn't. No, it, yeah. I, there was no. There was no question. Yeah. I, I was. I mean, that was just what I was doing, and. I have maybe a weird personality, but I, I guess when I have my head and go in a direction, I just keep going there. Yeah. And then, is that what you taught? I'm, I'm asking a million questions. Uh, to go. So, but when you were in that, when you were in that, you were trailer tent. What were you saying? You were trailer. Tent, tent trailer. We, were, we, were, we could only stay in a state park. This was in California. Yeah. You only stay in two weeks. So we're going from state park to state park oh, to state park wow. to state park and yeah. driving to... I did rent a uh, small space in Newport Beach to, mm -hmm. uh, to have the dark room. Okay. But that was more important than a place to yeah. live. <laughs> <laughs> so then how did you explain that to, the, to your kids that you're traveling around? I mean, did you... What, they just what, came along. Just came along? They were young. Yeah. Two and four, I guess, at that point. And then, so then when it was time for them to go to school, did you have to sort of... Find oh, they've been to so many schools. Oh, really? I I can't remember exactly when. Um, I think Jackie was eight or nine. We start we li start we uh, decided to live on a sailboat. Yeah, twenty six foot Columbia. Wow. Uh, then we moved up to a thirty five footer. But basically, we raised our kids on a sailboat, um, so they were used to simplicity. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that's sort of, I mean, so... No television. No television, right. Which is really hurting kids today. Yeah. So then how do you, uh, do you have grandchildren? I have two grandchildren. So, um, and they have televisions, I'm sure. They watch oh, TV. Yeah, oh, they, yeah. They've got like five. <laughs> and their, their iPhone. And yeah. So then what, what do you do with, like, how, what, do you take them out and just show them this? Well, we, we, we try to be as much 
with them as we can. You know, yeah. they have their own families too. But of course, uh, yeah. Yeah, we um, Nikki takes her, her granddaughter is really interested in photography. Okay, so she she takes it seems like Nikki works communicates really good with her. Yeah, so she takes her out photography all the time. Yeah, and uh, my my grandson is a little he's only twelve. So right, he's a little. I think he's getting to the point where he's I can spend more time with him. Yeah, yeah. So so do, um. Is that sort of something that you pass down? I mean, because you sort of, you have multiple things that multiple responsibilities. I mean, you have to, to teach your grandchildren this mm-hmm. and show them this, and then you have everybody who comes to your book signings and oh yeah, it doesn't ever wear down on you. And this sort of goes back to what we were saying before about you know one day waking up and realizing that you're famous. I mean, does that? Well, I basically um, this. Last fall and this winter, is, I'm I'm busy almost every day. Yeah. And when uh, May hits until September, I ain't doing nothing. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm photographing. Yeah, okay. And playing in the dark room. Okay. So it gets to a point where you have to say, if what's, you know, it's like this right now. It's like, what's first, the art or the communication? So I'm, I'm going to break it down to part of the year is communication. Yeah. Part of your year's art because I can't. If I can, I could be busy every day giving talks. Yeah. But it's not getting anywhere in the art field, right? Which is going to bring people closer to nature, hopefully. This has been part four of Clyde Butcher's podcast. Up next is part five. Part six of Clyde Butcher's podcast, and because black and white really is, I think I don't, I don't know what I mean, I'm sure this is a big controversy. It's mm. classified more as art than color. Mm. Um, yeah. For one main reason, it's archival. This is true, and um, color is. Uh, I'm sure everybody will object to my concept here, but I've tested it, and it's not archival. Yeah. So, of course, archival is a different word. People don't understand what archival means. It means you do the best you can in the media you're using. That's what archival means. Say it again. You do the best you can for longevity in the media you're working in. Yeah. So, in other words, if you're working with inkjet, you work with a, the printer that has the best long inks and you use the paper that has the best longevity. Yeah. And that's as archival as it gets. It may be three weeks, it might be twenty years. Yeah. But that's what you if you do the best you can right. that's available, that's really what's called archival. And you're not finding that. For color for color. Well that's like the it. like the color R C paper, they do color print wet prints and the paper's good for twenty seven years. Mm. The emulsion might be good for eighty. Yeah. But the paper's only good for twenty seven. So it doesn't matter. This is yeah. according to the uh, to Kodak and, and Ilford. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So then, okay, so then let's talk about, you know, archival and uh, uh, work and, and, and keeping your, preserving your work. And, and we sort of talked about this a, a little earlier. Um, your photos, I mean, you want it to be around forever, obviously. I mean, that's the point of, of, mm-hmm. of having a body of work and, or any work period is you want it to last. Um, but, of course... This isn't going to last. Like the the nature isn't going to last. And some of the things you mm-hmm. you're photographing aren't going to last. Right. Do you ever take a photograph and and look at it and say, this is just like an, an almost like an historical piece because this is this is you know what I mean this isn't something that everything I do is historical. Yeah. Because you know you can have a volcano there goes the mountain. Yeah. Uh, in Florida. It's it's biological. Yeah, I mean, most of the scenes I take, they're different every year. Yeah, this plant dies, this new one comes up. Um, right, you get you get a flood, you get a, a drought, you get so actually, there's really very few things on this earth. Maybe there's nothing on this earth that's right. lasting. Right, people have a tendency to think you can set roots down. This is going to be my. Yeah. Well, yeah, for a little while. Yeah. So then, so then things aren't as. But we try to make people feel as good as they can, 
and have as good of experience as we can as long as it's possible. Yeah. In other words, um, the, this day is beautiful. Well, why complain? It's beautiful. Let's enjoy it. Yeah, just to, I mean, and, and that's sort of where you're coming from in your work is just enjoy mm -hmm. it, right? Because it's not, you know, um, it, it's just not. It's sort of accepting that life's not precious. I mean, it is precious, but it's not like things aren't precious. That things change. That things happen. And it's, right. You know, well, be affected. <clears throat> yeah, it's yeah. Um, because of nature, because of greed. Yeah. There's all kinds of elements that create change. Uh, we need to keep working to do the best we can. Yeah. We're not doing too good at that. Right. But we do the best we can, and we hopefully are pleasant to other people. Yeah. And that's, a, a, I think, a nice thing to do. Right. Don't honk your horn too much, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, it's... Yeah, just... The, everything that I know, mm -hmm. all the people that I meet, politicians, engineers, uh, I mean, I meet a huge amount of people. And the, all the things that I know that are happening in the world, I can be very pessimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I try not to be because I have a beautiful wife for right. 48 years and I have beautiful, beautiful kids. and uh, so we just try to do the best we can, and I, I you know, I know that uh, I'm not going to change the world, right? But uh, we hope we can make a little bit of difference. Do you get frustrated, or do you, um, do you just sort of accept and hope to to lead people into a good, a positive direction? I mean, do you get frustrated when people? Um, oh, I get extremely frustrated. Yeah, people, particularly with people with a lot of money. Yeah. Because they could do things right for a minuscule part of their income. Yeah. And they have these rationalizations. I, and I think the reason they don't, I don't know, maybe I'm really off base, but their friends think, what are you, environmentalist? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but well, I've been with billionaires that don't want to put uh, solar panels on their roof. You no know, one even sees their roof. Yeah. I mean, they can go out and buy a, a painting for $2 million. Right. And don't put twenty thousand dollars in solar panels on the roof. Yeah, I mean that that frustrates me. And you deal with these people all the time. All the time. So it has to be just so. Every once in a while, every once in a while they do it though. Oh, oh, so that's what you. I mean, that's is that that's what sort of keeps that going. For I you, was though. working with a developer, and uh, I said I would do some things for you if you put solar panels on every house you build, and he did. Wow. So every so, once in a while it works. So I mean, get, <laughs> do you, I mean, and, and, and you don't have to get into huge detail, but can you give me sort of like a a story of like a really good success uh, of communicating and seeing the change? And so, well, that person? was that. That, that was, was that, that. That was that was the best example. I yeah. mean, um, I know they put it on. I think it was like at least a hundred homes. Mm. That's a huge. And it was uh, that's a huge amount of homes. two kilowatts. Yeah, uh, two kilowatts per home. Yeah, so that's what uh, two hundred kilowatts. Wow, that's a huge. You know, that's a huge change. So you know it that it, it yeah. worked, but uh, I keep trying. Yeah. This has been part six of Clyde Butcher's podcast. Up next is part seven. This is part two of Clyde Butcher's podcast. Now you said you said that this is going from uh, sort of like putting things or from from an Ansel Adams like a really interested in the, the composition mm -hmm. and moving in more environmental. Right. So does that mean that your your objective in, in shooting, like your your overall um, sort of like thesis of your of your work, has has constantly evolved. I mean, is it sort of just like it's it's become less about the work and more about? I've become more of a teacher than a photographer. How does that feel? I think it feels great because we, there's a lot of be teaching to be done. In the yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is very uh, true. People live in the urban. I mean, how many people live in the urban percentage wise? Compared to out in the farms and the woods anymore. Yeah. What, 95% maybe? Right. That's a lot. It's a lot. 
So we have to uh, try to get people at least get the feeling of the environment so they understand how the importance of it is. And so, you know, because it is like, the, especially organizations like, you know, NGOs or um, just a lot of people with who, who are very active in their community and this is in the mm -hmm. society. I mean, they are living in more urban areas mm -hmm. and so that they're not getting that, that constant sense of what's, what else is out there, what they're, they're missing. I mean, do you feel like that's sort of, well, it's, it's like, it's really kind of funny because like when you have a, uh, Sierra club convention, right. It's in downtown San Francisco. <laughs> right. It should be, it should be out in the, it should well, be out the Dewey somewhere yeah. or, or up in Yosemite or, yeah. uh, in Miami, we have Everglades convention. It's in Miami. Yeah. We should we should have it out in the Everglades somewhere. Why do they do? It's just easier. It's for easier, travel, yeah. and um, there's no mosquitoes. Yeah, <laughs> and the people can drive their SUVs there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, do you think that that that's sort of like? I mean, obviously, you you know are are in these organizations uh, to help spread the word and and, mm -hmm. and educate. But do you also sense that in, in these organizations that there is a lot of, um, there's still not, people still aren't taking the, their own personal responsibility? Like you said, like driving their, their, well, I can you tell know, you some sad stories. Oh, really? No. I was, at, well, I don't know if I should even say it. I, should, no. I shouldn't get into it. Oh, okay. <laughs> this was an environmental organization, of national. Mm -hmm. uh, all the board was there, all the uppity ups were there, and they uh, gave me a nice, award and yeah then they asked me to talk and at the end of the talk i asked them what are they doing personally mm -hmm. for the environment one person had a car that had good mileage they were not putting any uh, led lights in they weren't putting any solar panels in they were doing they said oh we're working for the organization well i just i said personally personally yeah oh I mean, I have to be personally responsible. <laughs> oh. That was that. They were. I don't know. They never talked to me again or what. Really? Yeah, but, yeah. But uh, you, you have to put it to people. Yeah, I mean, when you find that out, I mean, when you 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 deal with people, I mean, is it is it? I mean, you because you communicate, and, and we have videos playing in the gallery of you communicating to huge amounts of people, mm -hmm. but it is such a personal. Uh, problem because it is it's just yeah. changing sort of just the mindset right you know well one of the problems is that in the educational system of television mm -hmm. and papers and all this different ways people are not being educated right to do it's really interesting that a, a, a television station will do a program once mm -hmm. that's it now if it's OJ Simpson right it's Ten times a day for three months. Yeah, but if it's important on the environment, it's once every five years. So you don't keep saying the same thing yeah. over and over and over again. It the people, the the government, and the the whole situation is so complicated, and our lives are so complicated. Unless you beat it in. It's not going. It's not going to stick. So then, you know, recently I've noticed since oh gosh, um, since probably like two thousand five or or six that all of a sudden GE is saying let's go green, and uh, you know, and, and then on NBC, and, you know, uh, uh, Viacom, it's all these giant greens. You have these huge corporations saying let's go green, let's mm -hmm. you know. Um, I guarantee you, they aren't going green. Right. So then, when when you see that kind of thing, I mean, does that hurt you? It really, it's, the, the word going green means you do one little teeny thing right. and you're going green. Yeah. Like if NBC wanted to go green, they would figure out how many kilowatts of electricity their whole organization uses and set up a solar field yeah. to produce that amount of electricity. Yeah. That's green. They would change all their light bulbs to LEDs. You know, they would make sure everything is insulated properly. There, it's a, if you're going to go green, it's, it's, it's a very <clears throat> complicated issue, but very simple to do. Right. 
Right, and it is, but it is sort of that. Thing. I mean, so so going back to you talking to these mass group of people, I mean, you're trying to hit them on a personal level, and, and how do you go about that? Is it? Do you feel like you get a better response when it's when it's one on one instead of met, like a, a an, an auditorium? Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, I've gone to there's there's two kinds of uh, audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the audience, audience that you're speaking to the choir. Mm-hmm. Then there's the audience that you're not speaking to the choir. Yeah. Now, the ones that I speak to the choir, which are, you know, environmentalists and people that are kind of in the same tune, you know, will ask you questions and such. Yeah. Okay. But now when I go to an audience that's not part of the choir, right. people that have no idea what uh, the environment's about, they will not ask questions until the talk is over and they do it personally one to one because they don't want their friends to know they're interested. Yeah. <laughs> so so getting that. there's a couple different kinds of audiences. And so when you're getting that kind of like you're you're having that sort of conversation, I mean, why do you think people are so afraid or are like you know, are are, are because, not willing to because subconsciously they know they're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. But they don't really want to admit it. So, so then, I mean, you've been talking to people for years about mm-hmm. this. So then what's the best way to approach or get, you know, a, a response, a, a good response or results? I'm not sure there is. Yeah. The only way I've gotten the best response is to explain to people how much money I've saved doing it right. Oh, uh, well, see, there I you mean, go. Like, for instance... Um, the university in Fort Myers put in LED lights in their parking garage. Cost eighty thousand dollars. <gasps> That's a lot of money. Well, the first year they saved sixty thousand electricity, and they're supposed to be good for twenty years. So that's a one point two million dollar yeah uh, on their eighty thousand dollar investment. Now tell me where you get that on a CD. Right. Exactly. There's no way, yeah. nowhere you can get that kind of return. No. No. And I mean, so then it is, it is money that, that, that talks. And, and, and money, you know, people ought to start understanding. Like, yeah. in my little gallery, I put in LED lights, and I went from $360 a month electrical to 150 Wow. Just by changing light bulbs. Yeah. Wow. And I'm going to make a <clears throat> $4,000 investment. I'm going to make a $50,000 profit over the time of the bulbs. It's amazing. So... I'm making money by spending a little bit. Yeah, just up front. But it's thinking a little long term. Right. This is part two of Clyde Pusher's podcast. Up next is part three. This is part three of Clyde Pusher's podcast. I mean, your work really stands for something. I hope it, uh, it, the uh, things I photograph are being around the next hundred years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, now, is that... So then this is sort of a, a good segue because you're capturing, for instance, some landscapes and some um, trees and, and, and uh, um, rivers and lakes and, and you know, uh, mountains that they may not be here. Mm-hmm. In the next, well, there, there's of there's two ways they not, might not be here. Yeah. One, um, the ninety second Congress had, I think it was a hundred uh, parks they wanted to settle. Yeah. So you know they could take a bulldozer in there and bulldoze uh, the badlands, make it flat, get rid of all those bumps. Mm-hmm. Uh, Florida has the new governor has four hundred and twenty five thousand acres of land that we've bought that he wants to sell to developers. Mm-hmm. Then there's the catastrophicness of global warming and weather change. So there's, but which is being caused by the human being. Right. So we have a huge task to try to keep this beautiful world. And one of the things I try to explain to people, the world's round. Yeah. People say, what do you mean? I know it's round. Right. Then the next question is, do you treat it like it's round? Oh, I mean, I'm supposed to be responsible? Oh, ah, yeah. yes. Yeah. So that's the, the kind of message. Like every slide presentation or 
PowerPoint I give, I end with a picture of the Earth from outer space. To say this is you know where we're at. Yeah. This little spaceship. Yeah. I mean, and that's and and and, and since you began, I mean, have you noticed a significant change in 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 the lands that you? I actually, I've I've noticed. Good change and bad change. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening. Yeah. And a lot of bad things happening. Uh, most of the good things are happening is what humans are doing to correct mistakes. Yeah. And the other ones, obviously, are humans that are taking advantage of the environment. And so when you started, I mean, obviously, climate change and global warming, and, I mean, that wasn't... That was um, not a, even was a thought. Thing. No, yeah. no. So, but what it was a thing yeah. was the Cahoga River burning. Oh, yeah. Uh, smog. That's right. Um, the, all the trees and the smokies dying from the uh, industrial pollution. Uh, that was major in the 50s and 60s. And that's why we, people don't forget who's the best environmental president we have. Jimmy Crick. Tricky Dick. A Tricky Dick. Nixon created EPA. Clean water, uh, clean air, EPA, uh, everything that's environmental law today is, was created in Nixon's administration. I did not know that. And unfortunately, if he hadn't been for Watergate, he right. would probably be named, known as a, a famous president. Right. You know. For that, for, for I mean, for that. And it's funny, I mean, he put all of that in, into, I mean... He of course, put, now they're trying to get rid of that. They're trying to get rid of it. It's the same party. Same party's trying to get rid of all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, Just, it's not the Republican Party anymore. I, right. I don't want to get into politics. Right, no, no. But it has, I mean, obviously, yes, it has changed drastically. Well, yeah. But, I mean, you've also, you, I mean, you have a, a bit of a relationship with Jimmy Carter. Oh, yeah. I, I really love, I gave him and his family over a Christmas vacation, a, a Swamp Walk. We were with him all day, and he was, oh, he was perky and smiling. He was, said, oh, it's been a long time since I've been one in a swamp, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, we're up to his waist in water, and the Secret Service people are panicking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was that was the Secret Service was fun. But did they go in the swamp? The Secret well, Service go in the swamp? They have to. They had to. Yeah, they're responsible. That's in fact, funny. at one point, they had figured out we're, we're supposed to go back because they didn't want to be in there very long. And I told the pre- I asked the president, we should go on here because it's prettier, but they don't want us to. And he says, No, I don't listen to those guys. <laughs> so we head off in the into the swamp, and the Secret Service are going the other way. All of a sudden, they realized the president was gone, uh, <laughs> and they panicked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lot of fun with. I've had fun with those guys and a lot of different uh, politicians. Oh, really? Yeah. Did you call Jimmy Carter Mr. President, or did you call him Mr. Who did you call him? I called him Jimmy. Jimmy. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He sends me. Um, he paints, you know. I did know that. Yeah. And every year he sends me his his, paint, his new car, green cards for the year. Oh, wow. That's kind of neat. That's a really um, special thing. And he's a woodworker. Yeah. Um, obviously, his uh, politics is still going on. was trying to save the people around the world. And Right. He's uh, a huge hero of mine. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a very intelligent man. Yeah. Yeah. This is part three of Clyde Bush's podcast. Up next is part four. Five of Clyde Butcher's podcast. So then you, I mean, you started off and you never thought that you'd be, would you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, did you ever think that you would become, you know, um, a, a, a giant sort of spokesperson? Or the better term is uh, uh, you'd be going out to bat for... for I, was, I was from a blue-collar family. Yeah. A sheet metal worker. <clears throat> um, I had... No visions of what I'm doing today. Right. Absolutely none. Yeah. Um, and on the path I'm t- I've started to take started in 1986. Uh, seriously, on the on the environmental movement, when my son was killed by a drunk driver. Yeah. And I decided, you know, I'm I'm doing stuff that seems like it's doing things, but I think I could do more. Yeah. And that's how I went from color to black and white. So then, if you don't mind, let's. If we if we could talk about that a little bit, because it's I, yesterday when I was talking with Nikki, she said that 
um, that it was a huge moment for you to, for both of you to reevaluate mm -hmm. what, what you had been doing. Right. So from, I mean, you're as an artist, I, I mean, was this a huge moment where you just said, and what was that? What was that? process like of saying I'm going to switch to black and white I mean what well, was that <clears throat> the question, I've been questioning the color for a year yeah <laughs> I just felt that the color wasn't communicating the essence of nature yeah because it's just too much color you start seeing the color you don't see nature you yeah. don't see what you're supposed to be seeing and then when this this happened it really hit me that this is what I need to do yeah um, I had no preconception that I would ever sell anything. Yeah. That I would ever make a living. Nikki was doing hand painted black and white, which was colorful, so people were buying it. Right. And she said she was going to support us because she knew that nothing would sell. Right. So I just jumped off the bridge, got an uh took all my color work to the dump, maybe four hundred thousand dollars worth, wow. and watched the tractor run over it. And bought an 8x10. I was shooting 5x7 before then, a color. Yeah. And I bought an 8x10 because I wanted to do more detail. Yeah. And I just threw myself into it. And one of my best shots was taken in that first couple of months. Wow. Uh, the Moonrise and, yeah. and Ochoppy. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, photo. So it, it's it was really inspiring because I was photographing what I wanted to photograph. So did your... I mean... Is when you lose somebody that's so close to you, um, I mean, did, did, did it derail you at all for a while? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, it was June 15th on our anniversary. Oh, wow. And Father's Day. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until we went to a show in Ann Arbor. I think that was August, late August. That uh, that period of time, I sat down. And I just, and when I was at the show looking at my color work, I said, "That's it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do what I think should do." And my first show in black and white was Thanksgiving. Wow! And it was successful, which was really shocking. That had to be such a like rewarding experience to it, know. It, it, it was... really, it really was. But we didn't believe it was. We thought it was a fluke. Okay. Was then, it emotional? Then, then about was? 20 years or so later, you guys still fluking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not the same fluke. <laughs> yeah. Was it an emotional sort of experience to see those photos be a success? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was fantastic to see that my idea, my concept, my, 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 my perception was correct. Yeah. Uh, and I, at that point in time, I started working with uh, actually water management of Florida and Sierra Club and Audubon, Nature Conservancy, and, right. and really got into helping these organizations. Ask them, what do you need? Yeah. And uh, I worked with Wilderness Society. I've worked with most of the Wildlife Fund, um, UN. Yeah. Wow. Um, so basically, that was the right decision. Yeah. Part 5 of Clyde Butcher's podcast. Up next is Part 6. This is Part 7 of Clyde Butcher's podcast. I began this portion of the podcast asking Clyde about educating our children on the environment. Here's his response. I get so upset of people thinking they can make success by changing kids' attitudes. What that's doing is saying, okay, I'm going to let the next generation fix it. That's true. And then what's going to happen when they get old? <gasps> we'll let the next. next generation fix it. Right. The people we need to be talking to are the old farts. Yeah, who have the money and the power. They have the money and the power. Yeah. And you just, I don't have a problem teaching the kids. Of course. But your main emphasis should be on the older people. Well, because they set the precedent for their own children and their children. Well, absolutely. Children. Yeah. I put solar panels on, they're going to put solar panels on. Right. Yeah, because then his, you know, if he has children and his children take over the business, they're going to be, they're going to grow up with a, a right. much more environmentally aware right. father. Yeah. Right. Like my house, I have 32 bulbs in my house. You turn right. every bulb on, 
Yeah. 180 watts. It's oh. one bulb, one incandescent bulb. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, of course, I only have a 940 square foot house. Okay. <laughs> but still, it's 32 bulbs. Yeah. And it's 180 watts. It's amazing. You know. And it's not, these things uh, are I had. I, it was really difficult. Right. I had to screw out one, screw another one in. <laughs> So, but do you run into people running? Do you run into people saying, "Oh, well, the, in this economy, oh, well, the economy is so tough. How can I? Po- I can't. I can barely put food on my table. How can I possibly?" I mean, do you run into well, that? Well, sure, you put it into that, and I say, "Well, put it on your Mastercard." Yeah, and, and no, and and in in three months, it'll have already been paid off because you save that much money in electricity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like in my gallery, I went from. Three hundred sixty dollars a month to one hundred and fifty. That's yeah. what two hundred and ten dollars a month. It's amazing. So yeah, you, unfortunately, you have to figure out to how you can start thinking long term. Yeah, because short term kind of means a short term Earth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is, and and and, and it's. I mean, are you happy, though, to see that recently people have become um, more aware, or it's more mainstream to be aware of, of, of the environment than it it's, used to be? It's, 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 no, it's not. It's not? You don't feel like it you is? You look at any p- political poll, Yeah. the environment's not on the poll. Hmm. Take a look at the polls. Yeah. You'll never see the environment on a poll today. Yeah. So, so Does that make any sense? That's that gives me that's the concept that <laughs> that's we're not frustrating. We're, yeah. we're not in the mainstream. Yeah, and that's because of television, and radio, and newspapers. Right. These guys do one environmental story on one subject, and that's it again. That's and it. We're back there, and you, you people have to learn, and they don't listen until you. You go on television, and Geico. Right. Okay. How many times a day do you see Geico ads on? Oh, probably three, three per hour, three yeah. per half hour. Yeah. On one, on one station. That's pound, pound, pound. Yeah. That's the way they're making it work. Yeah. If you want to save the environment, you got to pound, pound, mm-hmm. pound. Not just tax something. Oh, do you know, oh, can you say something? Yeah. I mean, it's it, maybe it's not sexy. But well, it's but it's a war. But it's a war. It's a war of survival, and people don't look if if the communication business would look at it as a war of survival. Maybe it would come out. Right. But again, those stations are owned by companies that are making money. Right. They're yeah. owned by corporations. They're not free. So then, so then um, the advertisers are probably dropping. Yeah, this is very true. Yeah. Who? So Nixon was your favorite in this sense. Well, in the environmental. In environmentally, yeah, yeah, because that was a huge thing to yeah. say to businesses, you have to do it right. You just can't throw your garbage in the water. You well, can't throw your garbage in the air. Yeah. That was huge. And they're trying these new Republicans are trying to get rid of that. Who's your least favorite in the for in the environment? <sighs> Reagan. Yeah. I I you know I'm not surprised you said that. I I, I figured yeah. First thing he did is took the solar panels off the White House. Yeah. Why would you take them off? They're there. Well, it takes so much money just to get it off, too, so you're, you're losing just that much more money. Yeah. But why take it off? Right. It's making money. He took it off because of the corporations. I guess. He didn't want to have any symbol. He was interested in the environment. Yeah. You know, he. it was the last Republican I voted for. Yeah. I voted for Reagan the first time. Did you feel cheated when he did Oh, that? boy. He was supposed to balance the budget and right. all that stuff, and he's... James Watts was a uh, <clears throat> head of the Interior Department. Mm-hmm. But, and, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, we yeah. could we could do this all day. Right. <laughs> this has been part seven of Clyde Butcher's podcast. Up next is part eight. This is part eight of Clyde Butcher's podcast. And then my last sort of question I have, um, as, uh, I just want to touch on your, your work. And the one thing that I've noticed is, uh, well, I've noticed two things that sort of kind of go together is that you have a lot of, um, young, 
admirers, young mm -hmm. photographers who are admirers. And you also have, now I sit in this gallery every day mm -hmm. and I, I sit in my, my office is the actual gallery itself is on right. the floor in front of you. So surrounded by your work. Um, and I, so I get to watch everybody's reaction. The other thing I notice is people have a really emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people I've seen tear up on more than one occasion. I've seen people stand in front of a photo for a long, long period of time, more so than any other photograph I've ever seen. Um, you have those two things going on. What do you have to say to the young photographers who look at this work and see the visceral, emotional reactions of your audience? Um, what, what advice, what do you have to say to them? Photograph what you love. Yeah. That is the best thing I can tell you to do because if you love something, you'll try to figure out how to express it. Yeah. Whether it's cars, right. people, trees, yeah. ants. Just something. Whatever you love is what you should pursue. And you don't pursue something because someone else is selling it. Yeah. And so many photographers make the mistake of, oh, Clyde's Landscapes are selling. What we'll do is Clyde's Landscape stuff? Well, it usually doesn't work. But yeah. if they liked flowers, I mean, they really passionately, they would figure out a way to, to interpret a flower that people could interpret. Yeah. So that's my, my, my thing is do what you love. And is it, is it interesting? I mean, how, does it feel, how do you personally feel when I tell you that people become emotional over your work or and, and well, young people? You well, I, I it's one of the things that... Uh, when I do shows here, new shows, museums. Mm -hmm. uh, I watch people as they come in. Yeah. And I watch them as they go out. They're kind of, uh, as they go in, and they come out, they're smiling. Yeah. That turns me on. Yeah. They come out of a show smiling, not shaking their head. What was that all about? Right. When they, when they come out smiling, I did my job. Yeah. That's great. I mean, that's, that's yeah. the most, has to be the most rewarding feeling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have hardly ever seen anybody not smiling. That's that's brilliant, yeah. and you, and you've had that reaction for years now. Years, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's been really ever since I did black and white, and that color was never that way. Really, no, never that way. Wow. So then you really found yourself after you began artistically, of course. Uh, uh, after you, well, my black and white in the beginning was good. Yeah, but you have to realize when I began, Ansel Adams Moonrise of Hernandez was selling for seventy five dollars for a sixteen by twenty. I think it just uh, sold one auction the other day for three hundred thousand. Yeah. So that's and so I had I had I was I like photography, I enjoyed photography, enjoyed nature. So I went to color so I could match the carpet, I could match their couches. Yeah. So it would sell. Yeah. And that's why I went to color was pure. I wanted to stay into photography. Right. Um, which I guess could be considered good or bad. <laughs> I know you know it, it's. It's both. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, but, it is. But I, I finally discovered that I had to go back to my roots. Like I yeah. said, there's pictures in here that I shot in black and white before I started shooting color. Wow. And they're still good pictures. So what was that? <laughs> I, I, I said I had one last question, but I've, I've sparked one more out of me. Um, uh, your first, like, quote-unquote, like, successful photo, the one you first felt was, like, Mm -hmm. the, a, a powerful photo when you first sort of looked at it coming out of the out of the dark room I mean, what was that feeling like oh it was well actually watching the picture come up in the tray is pretty exciting yeah. but I think it was the um, uh, sand dunes I shot down in Glamis in 1971 yeah that said I, I really like I mean that's I turned me on yeah uh, and unfortunately today it still turns me on <laughs> <laughs> As it should, as it should. You're doing I mean, the right thing, yeah. I mean, it's really yeah weird. You can say you get turned on by when I see it. Uh, when I, I got some great images. I think this trip. I mean, yeah. I got really got turned on, and I'm, I'm sure when I make the first prints, I mean, it'd be really exciting. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's uh, mm -hmm. it's magic when you create something that's universal. Yeah, and you're doing it all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's. I keep trying. Yeah. Well, it, it, <laughs> that's all you can do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really uh, uh, 
a fantastic interview and I uh, appreciate it and I wish you, you and your wife the best and safe travels back to the other Venice, the, right. the Florida Venice. The warm one. The warm one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been the G2 Gallery Podcast. Tune in next time. We'll have some more artist interviews coming up.